So I'm gonna ask, is anti-aging total BS or is there something here? Oh, it's, it's absolutely not total BS. There's, there is a real um, science of aging that has made, I, I think, immense progress in the last 20 years in understanding what the biology of aging is. And I think all of our hopes, everybody in the field hopes that as we continue to gain that understanding, that provides opportunities to actually modify that biology in a way that will increase lifespan and, and health span. And um, there's no question we can do that in laboratory animals. So it's it's actually How pretty- How much? It, well, depends on the organism, but if we, if we talk about rodents, mice is what most people use today, mm -hmm. it's, at, fairly routine to be able to increase lifespan by 10 to 15%. Some things can do better. So the, the most effective intervention at increasing lifespan in laboratory rodents is caloric restriction, mm. has been for decades. Um, and you know it can get up to about 60% increase in average lifespan is, is the biggest effect that's ever been published. Okay, that hold on, many before years we ago. blow past that. Yep. So, uh, one, just a caloric restriction for people that don't know. You're just starving these poor little things. And as <laughs> actually, somebody- no, no. What do you mean? Because so this it's... is important. So it's, it's actually um, more properly referred to as caloric restriction in the absence of malnutrition. So okay. the idea here is to restrict caloric intake, but ensure that all of the vitamins, micronutrients are at appropriate levels. So it's actually not starvation. And I, I actually think that's an important point to clarify, um, but it is, you know, in the case of where 60% lifespan restriction was reported, a significant reduction in total calories of about 60%. It's a, it's this weird sort of relationship. 60% where reduction? From what they would normally eat if they could eat what they wanted, yes. Okay, so you and I define the word starving very different. To me, <laughs> as somebody that did probably 25% yeah. caloric restriction, and that might be generous, maybe it was a little bit less than that, but ballpark math is pretty close to that. Yeah. And it was miserable. Right. I lost a lot of fat. I got lean as hell. I right. looked awesome. I loved being naked. It was really cool. <laughs> but my business partners pulled me aside and my wife and said, you no longer have a personality. Oh, uh, yeah. And so, but it was on the back of, I'd heard like, hey, the one thing that can be replicated across yeah. every species, caloric restriction. And so I was like, word. Now, to be honest, I was doing it because I really wanted to get lean. And I just thought that that was going to be the way to do it. But it did not hurt my feelings that I was like, oh, and this is going to have life extension benefits. Now, as yeah. I've gotten older, Got more interested in the life extension, but 25% was brutal. Mm -hmm. And let's say that I'm overestimating and it was more like 20 or 15%. That was so unpleasant. Yeah. I can't imagine 60%. So there's a huge amount of nuance to, un to unpack here, right? One, one thing I think we should be clear on is mice aren't people. Mm -hmm. So we don't know does 60% in a mouse translate to 60% reduction in calories in people? We don't know. Would 60% lifespan extension in a mouse? translate to 60% lifespan extension in people, we don't know. My intuition is probably not. Yeah, why not um, though? Because mine's the same, but I'm way less Well, so, so it, it is, so there's a couple of, a couple of uh, reasons why I, I would guess that. One is there seems to be a trend that um, the ability from these kinds of simple interventions like caloric restriction to increase lifespan, the magnitude of the effect is shorter in longer lived organisms. So mm -hmm. you can go, so like in the laboratory, we commonly use yeast, which is single-celled, a nematode worm called C. elegans, fruit flies, and mice. Those are the four most common. And they live very different absolute lifespans. So um, a nematode will live about a month, fruit flies will live about three months, mice in the lab will live about three years. And the magnitude of, of effect you can get from interventions like caloric restriction decreases as you go to the longer lived organisms. Mm. Now, whether that will hold when you go from something like mice to dogs to people, we don't know, but I think it's a reasonable expectation that the percent effect at least probably gets smaller as you go to longer lived species. There's also some people who argue that um, the processes by which humans evolved long lifespan and other long lived animals, to some extent put them into a state that is already, you've already kind of gotten the benefits that you would You've get from caloric restriction. You've been evolutionarily optimized yeah. for that already. And yeah. so adding to that- Might really be much do, smaller, yeah. That's really interesting. And I was gonna ask you what the hypothesis was there. 
Uh, okay, so that makes a lot of sense. We don't know if it's going to transfer from mice, but we see some early signs that caloric restriction works incredibly well on rodents. Have we seen anything in humans? So let me take a step back because this is where I think the common perception and the way it gets presented um, often doesn't quite match up to what's in the literature. So it is absolutely true that caloric restriction is the most robust way to increase lifespan in terms of magnitude of effect. Mm. It's probably also the intervention that's been tested the most number of times. So it's, it's highly reproducible in a sense that many, many different labs and many, many different settings have shown you can extend lifespan with caloric restriction. What often is not talked about is there appears to be a pretty significant genetic component to whether or not or how big the benefits are going to be. And the best study that's ever been done was a study of 41 different lines of mice. So these are all genetically inbred, but genetically different from each other. Mm -hmm. And what they saw was that in about one third of the lines, you got this big lifespan extension, about maybe a little bit more than one third, you get a big lifespan extension. There's some where there's no effect. Hmm. And the thing that I find fascinating and also a cautionary tale is there's about 25% to one third of the lines where lifespan is actually shortened from, from caloric, caloric restriction. Yeah. Whoa. The same paradigm. This was a 40% restriction in this case. Now, there's lots of limitations to that study. So I think we, we have to say that needs to be redone better. Um, but the same thing has been done in other the, all of the other model organisms that I talked about, yeast mm. and worms and fruit flies. And it's pretty similar. There's about one third of genetic backgrounds where there's either no effect or a lifespan shortening effect from a single caloric restriction paradigm. So, and I think this is really important because humans obviously were, were genetically different from each other. There it, are absolutely gonna be people who are harmed by the caloric restriction protocol that you talked about, that you tried, 25% restriction. It's not gonna benefit everybody. And we don't really have a great understanding at this point of who is likely to benefit, who isn't likely to, to benefit. The, and, and you were talking about loss of body fat, which is really interesting. The one, one of the things that seems to correlate in the mouse studies with beneficial effects from caloric restriction, those genotypes that are able to maintain fat when they're calorically restricted seem to be the ones that get the benefit better, but able to maintain fat better. Interesting. The point I was going to make is the other thing that I think is about caloric restriction that's important to appreciate is um, humans are weird animals, and there's this whole psychological component to... Yes restricting food, yes. right? And it affects some people um, in psychologically in ways that I think are maladaptive, right? Mm -hmm. And and I know many people who have who have played around with different types of caloric restriction and um, and for some people it works great, but other some other people, you know, um, they they really struggle psychologically with uh, you know feeling like they're deprived. Sometimes even adopting behaviors that, that I'm not a psychologist, so I'm not going to diagnose anybody or psychiatrist, but appear to me like eating disorder behaviors, mm -hmm. right? And so this, this is where, again, I think we have to be careful about sometimes translating some of what these studies from laboratory animals, mice, which, you know, maybe they develop psychological responses to caloric restriction, but we don't test that in the laboratory. And, and they're not given a choice. I think that's part of what leads to the psychological challenge that some people have with food restriction is you're constantly being presented with a choice. Constantly. And so it's a battle for, you know, it's a battle for almost anybody mm -hmm. to maintain 25% reduction in calories from what they would normally eat or, or even in this case, what they would eat if they were trying to be healthy mm. and go 25% lower than that, you're constantly faced with choices to go off of that regimen. And I think that that leads to this sort of internal, you know, mental struggle and um, different people react differently to that. So that, that's not often talked about. And so that's why, again, I, I get a little bit um, worried when people write books saying that everybody should go out and do caloric restriction mm. or intermittent fasting or, you know, whatever. There's not a lot of attention paid to the fact that we know there's a genetic risk. There are some genotypes that aren't going to respond positively mm. to these things, and we know there's a psychological risk to some people. And and so I'm not sure I'm not sure we could be, should be recommending one size fits all sort of strategies around nutrition and, and diet beyond. Ooh. And I mean, you know, I get it. I understand why you're saying that, but I at some point people have to do something. 
And so it's like in the absence of people like you saying, look, there's no one size fits all, but probably yeah. eat like this. Yeah. You're gonna get the RDA, you're gonna get people eating the food, I guess not the pyramid anymore, the right. my plate or whatever it is. And that's been a disaster. Right. So it's like somebody has to step up with guidelines, but really fast going back to the first thing that you were saying. So when I went on that hypercaloric restriction for the reasons you're talking about, I said to Lisa, my wife, uh, I'm giving you the keys to when I stop this hmm. because I would make an extraordinary anorexic. And, <laughs> and, and I say that and tongue in cheek, that, right? but and I recognize yeah. that about yeah, yeah. myself. I pride myself on that discipline. It was man, it, the, the, the exercise was to manifest that effectively as an eating disorder with optimal nutrition. I was trying right. to make sure that I had all my right. bases covered, but I was like, this is going to be miserable. Yeah. I'm gonna be exercising like a fiend, eating as little, I was eating about 1,500 calories and I would guesstimate that my maintenance is roughly 2,000, that's why yeah. I came up with the 25%. Yeah. So it's like, it was somewhere in that ballpark. I'd lost the weight, so I know that I was in a deep caloric deficit. I was also eating well. But it was like, I know I can't trust myself because I had so much body dysmorphia that even though I had six pack abs and they were very defined and I was leaner than I'd ever been in my entire life, I just couldn't stop looking at that lower back fat. And I was just like, God, yeah. this is crazy. So anyway, I do think that's important. But going back now to, we're seeing these studies, the data's coming out, it's super nuanced, it's very complicated, but people are grabbing onto a narrative. I kind of think they have to, and whether that's, hey, here's my narrative for you to know how to eat, or here's my narrative for me to convince somebody to give me a grant, so that I can go study yeah. this. Yeah. So, so, yeah. So, let me make a couple of comments on that. One is, I think um, when we talk about nutrition for people, there there's a difference between recommending that people should practice caloric restriction. Which, let's just be honest, it's not going to work for almost everybody. There are very few people who can actually do the kind of caloric restriction that you did for a prolonged period of time and and you know stay on it. And but if it this works, experiment's does that been matter? done. I've, I've actually heard you give this argument before. Your answer is kind of interesting. What do you mean? So uh, should we pursue a path where we come up with a pharmaceutical and everybody can take it and great, but it could take 20 years yeah. and $100 billion? Yep. Or do we go, hey, this is the hard truth. Don't eat these things. Reduce your calories. And only the people that are disciplined enough are going to pull it off. Yeah, so that's an interesting question. Um, so there are a couple things I would say about, about that specific question. And honestly, I don't remember what my answer was that I gave before. Your answer so. was we, we <laughs> probably have to consider the, you, were, you weren't like, you know, forget the people that are disciplined. But you were like, sure. hey, we need to be thoughtful about the fact that the vast majority of humanity will not be able to do that. That's right. And so if we're trying to, you didn't say the words greatest good, but that was like the gist then we need to be thoughtful at not discarding the path. Because the I would say I had that interviewer's basic stance, which is I need to know what's true. Yeah. And, and if what is true is there's a way for me to eat and live that's gonna extend my life, even if it's hard, I would rather you put your time and attention there versus solving it for people that aren't gonna do anything. Got it. So, okay, so here's, here's what I would say around um, caloric restriction. So, so I think we need to differentiate between what I would consider healthy nutrition and caloric restriction. So there is absolutely no question in humans that a healthy diet will increase your likelihood of living longer and avoiding disease. Do you have a thumbnail as sketch of healthy? Older. Well, here's, here's what I would say. I don't think there's a one size fits all, right? So I think it's unfortunately at this point, um, largely information that most people know, right? Like avoiding ultra processed foods, right? Staying at, uh, avoiding being obese, certainly, I would actually stay avoiding being overweight. And I think actually the guide, guidelines we've got, you know, for as inaccurate as BMI is for the average person, that's not a terrible place to start. Mm. Get your BMI down into what would be called a normal range. Even if it's muscle that's well, causing Well, again, it. that's what I was saying. I was saying for the average person. So mm. this is where, again, I think we, get, we need to get nuanced. If, if you are a person who appreciates the importance of body composition, if you've had a DEXA, for example, and you know with some level of precision what your body composition is, absolutely you can go beyond BMI and say, okay, I want to get my body fat down into this range. And right. then you can even get more nuanced, like, you know, is it visceral adipose that you want to get rid of? So I think it really depends on what the audience is. But, um, but I think, again, you know, as a general rule of thumb, 
there's not, you, you don't, I don't think we should even necessarily try for a one size fits all nutritional strategy because it's it's clear that's that's not going to work. Is there for so while there definitely most people in my experience is no one size do this, there in my layman's opinion, there is a one size don't do this. Yes, I think that's fair. Yeah. And again, I mean I think it's it's um, hyper processed. What about sugar? What's your vibe on that? So my, and I think this is, I don't think too many people would disagree with the idea that we should avoid high levels of simple carbohydrates. Complex carbohydrates in the forms of vegetables are generally going to be fine for pretty much everybody. I'm not, like I've, I've um, I eat, I tend to eat a pretty low carb diet um, because I find for me that works really well. I'm not hungry. I enjoy what I eat. You know, I, it's not like I have to think a lot about how much I'm going to eat, um, and it helps me maintain my body weight where I want it to be. Mm. But I don't think necessarily that's that works for everybody. And I think you know some people have very strong opinions about meat products versus vegetable products. My personal view is I think the science is still a little bit unclear there. And in either direction. In either direction. Well, I think that you can you can certainly make the case that that a diet that's high in plant good quality plant based calories mm. typically is going to be pretty healthy, right? Because you're going to be eating a lot of vegetables, even fruits, you're going to be eating a lot of fruits. I'm not, again, there you can get a little bit into which fruits are high glycemic, you know? So I think that's that's sort of second level, but but for the average person, you probably don't need to worry so much about that and, and really just focused on cutting out the processed foods. I think a whole foods diet is pretty good. Mm. Um, that, and then just paying attention to, to how much you're eating. but. Again, I think the portions more or less take care of themselves if you're really not eating the garbage, right? Mm. I think the, the, the problem, I mean, and again, I, I, I kind of feel silly talking about this because it's stuff that everybody kind of has already heard before, sort of, right? Like this is, as somebody that records these kind of episodes all the time, the, one of the comments that we get the most is, pick a lane, which is it? Yeah. Am I supposed to eat meat? Am I supposed to eat vegetables? Like, what is it? Yeah. And so I'm actually gonna lay out so one, to orient the audience, we're definitely going to get more into what the, the influencers are grabbing onto that you think are problematic and then why you're still enthusiastic about this. But I think that it's worth, um, on this idea of a healthy diet, I'm going to lay out an abstracted from what you chew to what you're trying to achieve level and tell me if you think this is bang on. So if you're trying to balance performance and longevity, you're going to want to be uh, Optimal nutrition is gonna be the main thing. So you have to get your main building blocks, which is largely gonna be an amino acid profile so that you can build and maintain the muscle mass that you have. Keep that all-cause mortality as you get older is so linked to muscle mass. So you're thinking about that. If you're eating uh, a vegan diet, the odds of you being able to get that the right amino acid profile without supplementation is effectively zero. And so you can do it, but make sure you're thoughtful about your supplements. Uh, you can do it through red meat, but red meat or meat in general, and I'll assume nose to tail so that you're really getting all of your vitamins, macro, micronutrients. But the, the problem you're going to run into there, and this is going to be a big thrust in this interview, I have to assume knowing what you know, is you're going to turn mTOR on like crazy. And so if you're living in a world, and mTOR for people that haven't heard that, I won't even yet tell you what it stands for, but right now, just understand, it tells your body to grow. Mm-hmm. So if you want to add muscle, whatever, But you can imagine from a longevity perspective, if you're giving your body the impulse to grow forever, you're probably gonna end up growing things like tumors and things like that. So you run into a potential problem. And sort of the quick punchline of where I think your work takes us is you probably have to do something that has some of the same knock-on effects of caloric restriction. And so you said something that our audience may not yet understand, which is the difference between restricting your calories and not being overweight, yeah, which is gonna be an important thing that we'll talk about. But like, if I were to say, for people that are like, which of the fuck, which is it? Yeah, it, it isn't either. It's you're eating for something, you're eating for an effect. Now, if you think about that effect and you're willing to monitor yourself, you can actually figure out what you as an N of one should eat. Yeah, I think that's super, super important. So, so one thing I would say um, uh, is that, you know, I think again, the, que- the answer to the question is going to be somewhat different if the goal is to optimize versus, you know, just do better than we are now. Because again, I think the average person is so far away from optimal that that's where you can give these sort of general guidelines. The only way you're going to get anywhere close to optimal 
is by what you said at the end, actually measuring your own response, right? Mm-hmm. Because there's because again, this goes back to the the point that I made about even something as as blunt a tool as caloric restriction in mice, there's a significant fraction of genetic backgrounds that respond poorly to that in terms of longevity. And that's in a very controlled environment. Those are mice in a laboratory where we control almost everything about their environment. Mm-hmm. You take humans in the real world, and our environment is so complex that that on top of the genetic variation really makes it almost impossible to predict at an individual level what mm-hmm. optimal is going to be, which is why you need to measure biomarkers and have some confidence that those biomarkers are actually telling you what you think they're telling you. And that's where I think we're at a really interesting time in the field where we now have a plethora of biomarkers we can measure that we think tell us something about aging but we don't really know for sure how good a lot of these biomarkers are or, or how comprehensive they are. And so, you know, when you hear people talking about biological aging clocks or reversing aging, which is a term that I almost despise these days because it gets Why? misused so often, because it's not accurate. I mean, well, let me put it this way. Um, there's no evidence that anybody ever in a mouse or a person has taken a biologically old organism and biologically made it young again. That mm-hmm. just hasn't been, has not been shown to be done. There's no data to support that. But when you that. say that, do you say to yourself, yet? Or are you like, mm, this is oh, not yeah. gonna happen? I don't think, so there's nothing, there's no theoretical reason why it shouldn't be possible to reverse biological aging. I feel like there's still so much we don't understand about the complexity of biological aging mm-hmm. that it's going to be a long time until we're able to do that. But who knows? I mean, again, this is where you get into how fast is technology going to progress? We don't know. Right. Um, but there's so much that we still don't know. You can reboot your life, your health, even your career, anything you want. All you need is discipline. I can teach you the tactics that I learned while growing a billion dollar business that will allow you to see your goals through. Whether you want better health, stronger relationships, a more successful career, any of that is possible with the mindset and business programs in Impact Theory University. Join the thousands of students who have already accomplished amazing things. Tap now for a free trial and get started today. Uh, My intuition is it is far more complex than even most of the people in the field appreciate. And that the kinds of tools that we're using today, again, are still pretty blunt instruments. And Mm -hmm. the the one thing that, that could change that, and this is still an open question, is whether or not, um, epigenetic changes are really sort of this this, uh, primary upstream driver of aging. And we can get into that. That's kind of getting into the weeds a little bit. But there is this popularized concept um, that epigenetic changes are are really the uh, primary process of biological aging from which all of the downstream molecular changes, functional declines, diseases of aging derive. If that's correct, and I don't personally think it's correct, but if it's correct, then you could imagine a te- technology, um, and, and people have developed some technologies to do this, that can reverse those epigenetic changes, and thereby that would reverse much of biological aging. It's a, still really a completely open to, question, though. I want that to be true. Yeah, I would love partly, it to be true as well. <laughs> partly because it's easy to understand. Yeah. And so for a layman like me, when I started understanding genetic uh, epigenetic reprogramming, it was the first time where I was like, oh, wait, I get it. Aging boils down to yeah. the de-differentiation of cells. They're no longer an eye cell, liver cell, heart cell, whatever. They begin to sort of lose, what am I? And that is aging. But talking to you, it sounds like it's just, that's one piece maybe, but there's just a whole lot of stuff going on. Yeah, it's pretty interesting because if you go back 10 years now, um, you know, there was a, a pretty famous paper written called The Hallmarks of Aging, where mm. uh, several leading scientists in the field put together a collection of nine processes that, that, that at the time, and I think still today, um, seem to be particularly widely shared across the animal kingdom. Are these causes about the or biological indicators? aging process. So that's a good question. So they are, for the most part, um, molecular processes that could be causal. So it's very hard to prove causality, mm-hmm. right? But, but that could be causal. And they include things like accumulation of senescent cells, which we know. These are the nine. 
Yeah, these are the nine. That's one of the nine. Yep. DNA damage is one. Telomere shortening is one. Epigenetic changes is one. Mitochondrial dysfunction is one. So epigenetic changes are one of a collection of hallmarks of aging, and they interact with each other. And I think of it as kind of a network of interacting processes. Mm. And so there's two things I would say about that. Nothing has really changed from 2000, I think it was 2012 when that paper was written, to today to strongly suggest that epigenetic changes are any more important today than they were then in the mm. science. Again, people have used reprogramming and shown that you can improve some functions in a mouse. And so for your listeners who, who, who aren't aware, reprogramming is a technology that allows us to change the epigenetic state of an old cell back to what it was when that cell was young, or de-differentiate, as you said. Um, so people have used reprogramming now in mice and shown you can improve function in a few tissues. You can increase lifespan a little bit, um, but not even to the extent that you can do with rapamycin and nowhere near what you can do with caloric restriction. So for those following along, we will get into rapamycin. Yeah, 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 sure. So, so the, the point being that um, we thought epigenetic changes were important when this Hallmarks of Aging paper was written. We still think that they're important, mm. but it's not clear that they are any more important as some of the other processes that, that play a role in biological aging. And the real test of that is to take an old mouse, reprogram it, and make it young again. And if somebody can do that, believe me, I'll be on the bandwagon. <laughs> I hope that happens, but mm. I'm, my intuition is it's not going to. And, and I've actually starting to think that it's, it's probably unlikely you're even going to do as well as you can do with caloric restriction using the epigenetic reprogramming technology. Mm. Because I don't think that, that epigenetic changes are, in fact, any more uh, important than some of the other factors that we know play a role in biological aging. The last thing I'll say on this is, and this is where the field, I think, unfortunately, has um, become a little bit too narrow uh, because once these hallmarks of aging were sort of formalized, it created a structure that limited people's thinking. And so now, even though we know that's not everything about biological aging, it's created this structure that you, in order to get a grant funded, you have to frame it in yeah. the hallmarks of aging. And so almost nobody is actually asking, well, what else is there? Mm -hmm. What else might be important? And how do we find those things? And so I'm, I'm a little bit concerned that, that the, the field has narrowed its... Um, search in a way that will that's limiting us right now. Do you now. know who Eric Weinstein is? The name sounds familiar, but I can't you place it right really now. dig him. So he also is a mathematician. For people that don't know, you have a very impressive background in mathematics. Uh, and he is saying exactly what you just said about health and anti-aging <laughs> yeah. in uh, physics. Yeah. And he was like, string theory grabbed a hold of people's minds and won't let go. And we now have had 50 years. It's fruitless. It's led to absolutely nothing. But to be taken seriously and all that, like everybody's working within that framework and, and his whole thing is like, who's going to be the person that is like the young rock and roll researcher that steps outside right. of that right. and is not afraid to look crazy. And it's like, no, it's this thing over here. Yep. It's really interesting. Now, as the person who can embody the problem, I will say you need an organizing principle. Mm -hmm. And so... When I do interviews like this, I first write down like what the person's theory is, and then I try to understand. So one, it shows me that I understand where you're coming from. Like yeah. I could, I might be wrong in some unacceptable percentage, but I could reiterate to you right now what I think your thesis is. The reason I do that is I want to know what the predictions are, and I'm trying to do that so that I can categorize like what's going on. So for instance, you give me nine hallmarks of aging. My immediate question is, is there an underlying cause? Uh, yeah. Like, is there one thing that then manifests as these nine things? Because that gets interesting. Now, it might be a categorical error on my part or anybody else's part to try to bunch everything into the hallmarks of aging. But for instance, when I think about aging, even your own thesis has to do with inflammation. And so it becomes a question of, is this all, like, is this a game yeah. of inflammation? Like, yeah. if I can turn off inflammation, does that, like, what, we don't know what that is, but, like, if I identified that sort of switch of on inflammation, off inflammation, if I could somehow, and obviously inflammation is a good thing, so you don't want to eradicate it, 
But if I could turn that switch off whenever it wasn't doing the job that we want it to do, would that stop aging? So anyway, yeah. I, I don't need you to take that question seriously. My thing is there needs to be a framework. Well, I think that's a good good question. So um, so first thing I would say is no, changing or turning off inflammation or optimizing inflammation, maybe that's a better way to say it, would not stop aging, I don't believe. Mm. Um, so, you, so you asked, I think, a very interesting question that that not very many people in the field actually, I think, spend enough time thinking about. And, and we don't know the answer, but we've got some clues, which is, is there an underlying principle that is biological aging? Is there, can we actually boil it down to one thing, mm -hmm. right? And we don't know the answer. There are, as I alluded to this, there are absolutely links between the hallmarks of aging. You can draw it as a network diagram and make, make connections where we have evidence to support those connections. I think the best evidence that there is a something fundamental about the biology of aging is in every animal or organism where we've looked, we can identify single genes that significantly increase lifespan and seem to improve what we call health span or de delay the, the functional genes. decline. Single genes. So I can go in with CRISPR-Cas9 and I can edit some things. There are people trying that. Yes. Interesting. Yes. And we can do it in mice. Like again, what, this what is, is fairly routine. Gene? What's well, there's, there are many. So, so one of the cool things, so, so, so I'll answer your question in a, in, in two ways. Um, one is sort of from my own personal background. I started in this field in 1998 as a, a first year graduate student. Mm. Um, and that was a really cool time to be in the field because it was when the field sort of switched over from being observational to molecular and mechanistic. And one of the things that allowed that to happen were the creation of tools where you could suddenly do very detailed genetic, molecular, biochemical experiments in simple model organisms. So again, I, I talked about yeast and nematodes and fruit flies. Where, you, where they, they, they age so quickly, you can do it in a time frame that's amenable to discovery. Mm -hmm. At the same time, people created these things called genome-wide libraries where you could look across the entire genome at either gene deletion or gene knockdown and look for mutants that gave you whatever phenotype you were interested in. Now, I was interested in lifespan because I study aging. So you suddenly had the ability to look at 5,000, 10,000 genes and in a very unbiased way, ask which ones increase lifespan when you mutate them. Mm -hmm. And so that led to the observation. There are hundreds of genes that when you mutate them in simple organisms will increase lifespan. Now the effects are usually pretty small on the order of 10 to 30%. I would say a 40% effect from a single gene is is very large. That's towards the upper but end of what we've seen. Is there any unifying characteristic yeah, to these some. genes? So they they affect they affect the hallmarks of aging. That's kind mm. of how the hallmarks of aging actually evolved. Was because as we learned in about different mechanisms. ways. So was it like all hundreds of them slot into these nine things? I don't think you could ever say all because there's so much we don't understand. Mm. And this this gets a little bit to how science happens, right? I mean. You know, I, let's. So one of the things I did early and early-ish in my career was one of these genome-wide screens, and we identified hundreds of genes. But you don't go study all 300 of them. You right. pick a few, one of which was mTOR. So we'll come back to mTOR, I'm sure. Um, you pick a few, and those are the ones you study, and those are the ones that you figure out the mechanism. So there's still a lot of undiscovered country out there for things that people have never really followed up on. But but to answer your question. Yes, in general, you can point to certain pathways or networks that seem to be particularly important and work across the evolutionary tree, right? So, and I think that's what, that's again where a lot of the attention has been paid. If a gene in yeast affects lifespan only in yeast, that's not so interesting. Right. But if it also affects lifespan in worms and fruit flies and mice, then we start to think, okay, maybe that's gonna be really relevant in the real world. Mm -hmm. And so those are things like, um, growth hormone signaling, insulin-like growth factor one, IGF-1, insulin signaling, mTOR, um, and things in that network. FOXO is another uh, factor in that, that interacts in that network. So, mm -hmm. so, so those are sort of, to me, form in my own mind, a, a picture of an interacting set of very important factors that seem to modulate the biology of aging, which would be represented to some extent by those hallmarks of aging. And the way I think about it is there are certain nodes in that network that are particularly amenable to intervention in a way that will increase lifespan and health span. Mm -hmm. And that's where something like mTOR comes into play. Just turns out that 
and for reasons that I don't understand, but I speculate it had to do with the network architecture, that particular node, when you tweak it, has big effects throughout the, the network that, that then lead to our observation that you can increase lifespan and health span. And another thing that makes certain nodes more favorable is that you've got a, a, a range in which you can play before you push things the other direction. So again, all these things are going to have the potential not only to increase lifespan. So if you think about a certain gene, there's an optimal expression level of that gene for lifespan. Mm. None of our genes are intentionally optimized for lifespan, which is probably why it's so easy to find genes that affect lifespan. Hmm. Um, uh, but some genes, so that means you can, you can get it to the optimal, which would be increasing lifespan. But if you go outside that range, you're gonna go the other direction and you're gonna shorten lifespan. And, and it's much harder or much easier to break a system than it is to make a system function better. So all of these things, you have to be careful because if you tweak them the wrong way, you're actually gonna go to a place we don't wanna go. Mm. Um, have you ever asked the question, did nature have a reason for making sure that we die? Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting question and there are different people who have different thoughts on this. So the, uh, the, 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 the collection of people who argue that nature did evolve us to die, fall into the camp that, that would be called programmed aging. The idea there is there is an evolutionary, evolutionarily selected program mm. that causes us to age and die. And you can come up with speculative reasons why that might be beneficial. There are some cases where that seems to be the case. So salmon are sort of a classic example, right? Where they have evolved after re reproduction to undergo this rapid senescence process and die. Mm. Um, leafs are another one. So leaf senescence is another one where annually leafs will go through this senescence process and die. Way, yeah. So that's, that clearly happens in select cases. My personal view is that there's a much much easier argument and sort of going by Occam's razor, right? Let's just take the easiest explanation that works. There's a much easier argument that what, what aging really is, is an absence of selection. So once we do our job, we, from an evolutionary perspective, we pass our genetic information on to the next generation and we get them far enough that they're gonna be okay. Mm natural selection doesn't really care about us from at that point. So it's a, it's a selection shadow. There's no benefit from an evolutionary perspective to slowing aging at that point and making us live longer, aside from the little bit of added benefit from further reproduction. But most of the work is done early on. And then the, the, the benefit that comes from slowing aging and increasing lifespan falls off pretty quickly. And so the, so the idea would be that, that biological aging to some extent is an accident of evolution. It's an absence of selection. And, you know, these are fun sort of conversations to have, but you can't really test them experimentally. Mm. And so I tend to, I, I like to have the conversation when people start arguing about it, I, I tend to tune out because I'm like, this isn't interesting anymore. <laughs> but, you know, people love to argue. So, <laughs> All right. Well, I want to use a, a specific example to highlight some of the things you're talking about. So rapamycin. Yeah. Rapamycin tied to mTOR. Um, give us a brief history. So you're doing the dog aging project. The punchline is, let's see if we can extend their life and health span by giving them rapamycin. As far as I know, that's the only, while you're tracking other things, that's the only intervention? That's the only clinical trial as part of the dog aging project. Okay, right? so why, why did you think rapamycin would be the right thing to try as a clinical intervention to extend the life of dogs? Right, so I mentioned caloric restriction was the most effective way to increase lifespan intervention-wise in, in mice. Rapamycin is the second most effective mm -hmm. and again, seems to be the most reproducible. So there's a huge body of literature showing that genetically turning down mTOR can increase lifespan in yeast and worms and fruit flies and mice. And then there's another body of literature showing that pharmacologically turning down mTOR, and that's what rapamycin does, it's an inhibitor of mTOR, can increase lifespan in all of those organisms. So, and it's been done by many, many different labs. And so personally, I have a lot of confidence in, in that body of work because it's not one lab showing this one time and then everybody gets excited about it and, and then you know it may or may not be real. This has been reproduced over and over and over again. Um, and then in mice, there's a couple of features of rapamycin that are particularly, I think, um, relevant for potential to have an impact outside of the laboratory. One is um, you can start the treatment in middle age, and really that was first that, that was first demonstrated with rapamycin. I think so that was done in 2009. 
Um, before that, I think most people, myself included, would have been would have would have speculated that it would be very hard in an old animal to actually have a significant impact on lifespan and health. For span. sure. But that was shown with rapamycin. You get almost the same effect starting mm -hmm. at about the mouse equivalent of a 60-year-old person as you do starting at young age. And so from a we can talk about maybe why that's happening, but yeah, from a so... from a from a translational perspective, that all of a sudden starts to become pretty exciting because you can it's much easier to imagine a drug that you would start giving to people in their 60s, 70s, 80s mm -hmm. versus something they have to start taking as teenagers, right? So, yeah. so, so that was, and that also told us, I think, something fundamentally important about the biology of aging. Like what? That, 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 it, it, um, that there's some plasticity there, right? That at least at a functional level, you can actually reverse some of the functional declines that go along with aging. Okay, so, so this is the one I want to push on. So I am scandalized, scandalized by one of the findings I've heard you talk about. So you talk about rapamycin and the effects on um, oral cavity degeneration, yeah. just to lump it all into one thing. Mm -hmm. That, okay, fair enough. If rapamycin happens, which again is shocking for people that understand mTOR is about growing, rapamycin therefore, if it's inhibiting that, would lead most people to predict that you would get muscle loss if you're taking rapamycin. Yep. That seems pretty logical, but it doesn't. Yep. It actually seems to Protect. lean that it might do the exact opposite. And so you can grow bone back in your teeth. None of this is scandalous. Once you accept that, even though it's counterintuitive. All right, I'm waiting to the, see what scandalous. That how the hell does it impact the oral microbiome? I don't understand ah, that. That's ah. bacteria in my yeah, mouth. Yeah. What the hell does something that inhibits mTOR have to do with yeah. ba whether bacteria can thrive or not? Yeah, that's a really, I can't wrap my head around. Really that. good question. There's actually so so the real answer is we don't know for sure, but I think there's a pretty good speculative answer that uh, that's probably correct, which is that the reason you get the remodeling of the oral microbiome um, is because of because rapamycin is rejuvenating to some extent immune function. So most people don't realize this, right? But there's a Why huge interaction. Why inhibiting mTOR rejuvenate? Okay. Oh wait, can I guess? Okay, I'm, these are all your ideas. I want everyone to be very clear, but I think I understand. So one of the things that I've heard you say is you have uh, senescent cells. Some percentage of aging mm -hmm. is you get these cells that become senescent. Senescent means that they realize they're dysfunctional so they don't keep replicating, but they kick around still. And they give off an inflammatory signal of some kind. And so you get these autoimmune responses where because of these um, senescent factors, the immune system is going after them. So now you have this increased inflammation, a certain type of infl inflammation called sterile inflammation, meaning there's no bacteria present that's yeah. causing it. I, let me just, so this is interesting, because I had a conversation with somebody the other day about this, these terms, because I, I tend to use them interchangeably, chronic inflammation, sterile inflammation. All sterile inflammation really is is autoimmunity. It just means your immune system reacting against yourself as mm -hmm. opposed to a pathogen. So again, I think, I think to be clear, that's part of what's happening to the immune system with aging is the chronic signals given off by these senescent cells, which then it's not only causing your immune system to act against self, it, it kind of hyperactivates the immune system in general. The outcome of that is that you get higher levels of auto, autoimmunity. Senescent cells probably aren't the only thing causing that. But just but, to close that loop, if I'm taking rapamycin, it goes and either addresses those cells in some way, it yep. somehow lowers it the shuts inflammation. Off, it shuts off what people call the senescence-associated secretory phenotype, which is mostly this inflammatory signal. It's, rapamycin is one of the most potent interventions we know at shutting down the, the stuff that senescent cells are giving off. The and stuff, I like We that. understand some mechanisms, but again, it's, it, you know, it's, um, it doesn't really matter. The, what matters is that it shuts the cells off. But there's an important question for me in there, which is if that's the mechanism, is it rejuvenating the immune system or just giving it a break? Probably both. So here's the way I think about it. And again, I've, I've tried a few times to, to learn enough immunology to, uh, to at least you know, be able to talk to immunologists and I fail miserably every time. So I've come up with a very simple way that I think about this. So we know that what happened, one of the things that happens during aging is people talk about a decline in immune function, and that's mm. true. We are more susceptible to pathogens. We are less likely, our immune system is less likely to catch cancers early. So there's this thing called immune surveillance of cancer, which is why I think most cancers are strongly age associated, because as we get older, our immune system is less able to catch those cancers and kill them early. So then they become tumors, then they metastasize, and, and that's, that's when it becomes a problem. So immune function does decline towards some of the things it's, it's supposed to do, but there's this 
other thing that happens, which is this increase in the immune system doing what it's not supposed to do, which is autoimmunity or sterile inflammation. And I think what rapamycin does is it, it's almost like a reset. I, I don't know that it actually brings up the, the stuff that's, that's declined with age, but I think it knocks down this sterile inflammation to the point where the system can reestablish homeostasis. So functionally, it's a rejuvenation. And that's where, again, I think, you know, terms are important and, and we need to try to be precise in the words that we use. I think it's okay to say that, that we know things like rapamycin, again, at least in mice, can reverse some of the functional declines that go along with aging. It can also reverse some of the tissue pathologies that go along with aging. Did it reverse aging? No, it didn't make an old mouse into a young mouse again. That the best again we've been able to do with rapamycin didn't is around thirty percent. In a tissue specific way. Well, that's where it it depends a little bit on what level of resolution you want to you want to get to. Mm. Um, I, I I can't answer this with a hundred percent certainty because nobody's ever done it. But I am pretty sure that if you dug deeply, you would still find accumulated damage in pretty much any tissue that you look at in a mouse that's been treated with rapamycin. Mm. So it depends a little bit on how, what you look at and how, how deeply you, you look. And how you define it. So like when I think about anti-aging, what people really want, yeah. they want to go backwards. They want to feel better. They want to be able to contract yep. muscles harder, add yep. muscles easier, look better, tighter skin, that kind of stuff. Like there's a very specific set of Work things out. that they're looking for. I mean, this is what the question, right? Well, does, so exercise does all of those mm. things, right? Does exercise does reverse aging? skin? <laughs> if, you, if your muscles get big enough. <laughs> yeah, it's hard, harder on the face. So again, right, this is, yeah, no, you're right. But it depends a little bit on what you're, what you're looking at. This mm. is, that's, that's all, I mean, it's a really good example because that's exactly the point I was making. I was making it because I, you know, I'm a scientist from the molecular perspective. But it's the same thing. It depends on what, which, which phenotypes you're asking about. Mm. You can find some where absolutely rapamycin reverses it. If you keep looking, you're gonna find others where it doesn't. And I think exercise does the same thing, right? Certainly, functionally, you can, al almost anybody from where you're at now, you can functionally improve your body through exercise. Facts. So is that reversing aging? Again, it depends a little That's bit on how you wanna define That's it. That's a fun way to look at it. Okay, so very important to get our terms right. Definitely when I say, um, reversing aging, I don't mean optimizing for where you're at now. It's a fun framing, and that actually is more motivating to actually work out harder. Uh, but when I think about what I'm really hoping happens is that we get back to, and I imagine it will be the nine elements of aging or yeah. indicators of aging, um, but also there's hormonal profiles, there's all kinds of things that lead your body to not only do those things, but to do them either more efficiently, faster, better, whatever. Um, there is something, and I've heard, I can't remember the stat that you threw out. Oh no, it was you were talking to Peter, uh, Peter Atia. Peter Atia's kid was on his scooter or whatever. He falls down, mashes his face, gets up, blood everywhere. Peter's like, how fast can I get to the hospital? And he said like a week later, he had like yeah. a minor mark left on. <laughs> and he was like, if that had happened to me at my age, he's like, the scar might last for a year or more. Yeah. And there is some, like, I don't know how we define that, if it's just efficiency, if it's yeah. that the system isn't bogged down by the damages that you're talking about, but there, there's a, a way to classify youth that we're trying to get back to. Whatever that bundle of things is, mm. we're trying to get back to that. Now, I am, this is how we started the episode, I'm one of the people that really, one, because I want to live as long as I can, have the greatest health span possible, I want to make sure, I want this stuff to be real. So I have like this vested incentive, meaning I don't want to die, yeah. that this becomes real. So I get very emotionally invested. I get very excited. I recently had a guest on the show. His name's Brian Johnson. And he, I don't think he would call himself a scientist, but he's been very successful. And so he's able to throw a lot of money at his body. And yep. so he spends something like $2 million a year trying to reverse aging. Now this gets into measure what matters. Are the clocks real, are they not? Are we looking at the right things? But when I sat across from him, he looks like an elf from the Lord of the Rings. And so he looks great. And I had interviewed him probably five years earlier and he looks better now than he did then. Now that doesn't mean he's reverse sure. aging. Um, but 
how do we begin to like parse out, like you believe in this enough that you're doing a gigantic trial, you've dedicated a huge portion of your professional life to seeing if it works in dogs, presumably not just for dogs, but for humans. And so what should we be measuring? And what like path are we actually gonna go down? Because Brian has a blueprint protocol that I'm about to do. And based on this discussion, it's like either I go, maybe we're not able to measure the right things yet. Maybe, yeah. you know, it's yeah. it's the hype has gotten a little ahead of itself, or maybe it's worth a shot. So I, again, I think this is a, there's a there's a ton that we could talk about to unpack here. And it it again is is super nuanced. But um so one thing I would say is I'm I'm not so sure that exercises and and nutrition are fundamentally different from rapamycin. Exercise hits the hallmarks of aging, right? It affects biological aging. So, so I don't put those in different buckets. I actually think about them in my own mind as um, different ways to tweak the, that network. And, and again, this gets back to, I think that there are certain interventions and ultimately probably combinations of interventions that get us closer to tweaking that network in, an, in a way that optimizes functionality or health or vitality or youthfulness, right? I'm again, and I'm also not so sure that at least in my own head, I have a bundle of things that I would say I associate with youth that are fundamentally different from what I would put more in the bucket of sort of overall health span or healthy longevity. I mean, being able to function at a high level the way that you want to um, fits into both buckets. The wound healing is an interesting one because absolutely there is an age-related decline in wound healing, our ability to heal from wounds. It's very individual. Not everybody experiences it at the same rate. And mm -hmm. you can modify it by knocking down inflammation, right? So, and you can do that by fasting, for example. So these things are, are tied together. I'm not sure that it's fundamentally different. Rapamycin is in, in, any, in any sense fundamentally different from some of the things that we can do with non-pharmaceutical approaches. Mm -hmm. It's just that most people can't do them in a in a consistent way. So the blueprint I think is really interesting. Um, so, so my take is that I, I probably 90% of that is just diet and exercise and 10% and of it is everything else. Mm. And there are a couple things I would say. First of all, I think, I mean, I think I, 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 think I have a lot of um, respect for the uh, intensity and level of detail at which he's approaching this, right? I mean, I think that that's great. I, um, I do worry a little bit about the markers being used. I don't think I don't think that they are necessarily telling us uh, ex about biological age or biological aging in any comprehensive way. Are you guys checking markers in the dog? Or are you just like let's just see how we long are. it lives? No, we are. We are. Um, so we are looking at the uh, epigenetic changes that happen in blood. We're looking at um, metabolome in the blood, microbiome, fecal microbiome. People have built clocks off all of those things. Mm. Um, we're also looking as, as best we can at functional measures. So, you know, activity levels, cognitive function, heart function, neurological function, um, uh, and lifespan. So I think you can start to paint a picture when you put all of those things together. If you're seeing the arrow going in the right direction, for most of them, that you've you've had an impact on the biology of aging. Um, some of these are exploratory, though. Like I talked about, the epigenetic metabolome microbiome; those are not things where people should have a high degree of confidence that they're actually measuring biological aging. And mm. in my view, I'm much more interested in functional outcomes and disease. You know, if I can if I can not have any diseases and be able to lift as much weight as I want and do the things I want to do, I'm, I'm much happier about that than if my biological age test tells me that I'm 35, right? <laughs> or vice versa. So, I'm, I, so I, again, I don't, I don't put a lot of faith in those, those tools at this point. I think there needs something to steer by. Well, or, I think, or maybe the average person does, I don't know, because maybe in your field you don't, but like at some point, and I think I'm speaking for Brian and that is a mistake, he should speak for himself, but if I had to guess, He's like, I need something I can look at to see if this intervention yep. that will only play out over the next 50 years, am I going in the right direction or not? I agree with that. I think the problem is you're not going to know until it plays out. So it's sort of a best so guess. Even directionally, you don't think... Eh, well, it depends on the test, right? So I think there are, there are certain, um, 
certain blood-based parameters that we know with certainty are highly correlated with specific diseases and with mortality over time, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you have a high level of blood glucose or HbA1c, right, that, that's a bad thing. And it's, it's, you're likely at higher risk for diabetes and early mortality. Same thing with lipid profiles that are outside of the, the normal range. So those are biomarkers, right? They're, you know, no different in that sense from the epigenetic clocks. It's just that we have a lot more evidence behind them telling you that, yeah, this is kind of where you want to be. We aren't going to know on the epigenetic clocks for a while. So most of these clocks have been built off of, in humans, have been built off epidemiological studies spanning 10, 20, 30 years. And so there's, there's, and so you can, you can show that you can identify patterns that are in that context predictive of three, five, 10 year mortality risk, right? What you can't show is that that's going to be relevant for you or me or any other individual. And what's often not appreciated is many of those samples were taken 20 years ago in a specific population whose environment has changed dramatically. Just think about our environment 20 years ago, right? So are those same parameters going to be relevant in our environment today? We don't really know. Right. So this is where I think we just have to have, so it depends a little bit on your, your level of, so how much certainty do you need? If you're, if you're just looking for what's the best out there, and let me take a take a best guess based on what we know today. I kind of like what 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 he's doing in terms of the, the comprehensive biomarkers. Um, so, uh, but but I I, I love the uh, the sort of sharing of data. I think that absolutely the approach of you know measure, intervene, measure again, intervene, measure again. That's exactly what we should be doing. That's the only way you ever get to personalized interventions. Mm. Um, so I think that's that's uh, really commendable. Um, All right. So if we're going to do measure, intervene, measure, intervene, uh, and what do you care, what, in terms of your own life outcome, what do you care yeah. most about? Your kids doing well? What, what's that thing? Like your deepest, like, I need this to happen and I will have been a good man. <laughs> It'll make sense in a second. So, uh, so what do I need to have happen for me to be a good man? So yep. uh, it's a funny question. So absolutely. I mean, I think I, I would love for my, uh, uh, probably the most important thing is that my kids grow up and be good people. Okay, perfect. Um, but, Let's take that. Okay. For, for this, we'll okay. get to the button in a minute. So if you live to 150, your kids will have just a glorious life and they'll live even longer and it'll all be amazing. Yeah. But it's all contingent on you making it to 150, which is, it's, that's a lot. Right? Mm -hmm. So oldest person on record, 123, something like that? Yeah, some people argue whether that was even fudged a little bit, but yes, 122 right, plus that a few ballpark. months. Yeah. Okay, so <laughs> you're gonna have to figure something out and you're yeah. gonna be doing this test, intervene, test, intervene. Yeah. What would you, with your deep body of knowledge and access to a gazillion people, what would yeah. you test? The truth is hitting your career goals is not easy. You have to be willing to go the extra mile to stand out and do hard things better than anybody else. But there are 10 steps I wanna take you through that will 100X your efficiency so you can crush your goals and get back more time into your day. You'll not only get control of your time, you'll learn how to use that momentum to take on your next big goal. To help you do this, I've created a list of the 10 most impactful things that any high achiever needs to dominate. And you can download it for free by clicking the link in today's description. All right, my friend, back to today's episode. It would probably include um all of the the current biological aging clocks. So here's a here's, so you would here, use here's them. the way I would frame it though. We don't know what they mean. So it would be more so so if again you got to play the long game, right? So if we're talking me living to 150, I got to go another 98 plus years, right? Wow. Okay. That puts it in perspective. <laughs> so actually, there's a there's a cool uh, visual I'll tell you about in a minute if if, if we if I remember. So. Um, uh, so, so you got to, so you got to recognize you want to capture as much data as you can because you're going to need to learn from that. Even if it's not telling you what what you hope it is today, mm. you've got to capture it now so you can learn from it as you go. Because you're going to be looking for patterns. Absolutely, yeah. So I think you would want to use what we currently know about the hallmarks of aging, and all of these biological aging tests are built off of that framework, right? Mm -hmm. They measure aspects of the hallmark. Would you be aging. measuring adipose tissue? Absolutely. So body composition would, would be part of the story. Um, certainly as comprehensive a blood panel as, as I could get. And actually, I think that's an area where people in, in my field haven't paid as much attention. There, there's, there have been a couple of um, blood-based clocks built off of, you know, clinical 
typical clinical measures. Mm -hmm. um, pheno age, I think, was the first first one. Because they don't um, know what to look for. No, or? because it's not as interesting as epigenetics. This is this is where shiny object you know comes mm -hmm. into play. Where are they getting the epigenetic read then? I thought it was in the blood. Are it they taking is. It so I'm talking stuff? about the standard clinical stuff that you I would see. get from a you know CBC cam and I you maybe so a they're few not other stuff. they're not turning those results into a clock. So then one has been built with with the like ten or twelve blood markers, um, but but there's a whole bunch of blood diagnostics that you can do that that are outside of the standard panel that most general practitioners mm -hmm. do that tell you important stuff about your health, right? Vitamin deficiencies. Like I recently found out I'm vitamin D deficient. Not shocking. Mm -hmm. I live in Seattle, but I take a vitamin D pill and I'm still vitamin mm -hmm. D deficient. Hormonal panels, like comprehensive hormonal panels. That's gotten to the point where, you know, there are a larger number of people who get them, but still the majority of people in their 50s, 60s, 70s never get a, a comprehensive hormonal panel. Would right? you do hormonal replacement therapy, not to derail? But... Um, so so I, I, uh, I, I would if it was appropriate. And I do believe that um, hormone replacement therapy has gotten a bad rap. So, you know, um, based on the literature that's out there, I think the the aversion to hormone replacement therapy it, for both men and women for different reasons, um, uh, it doesn't make a lot of sense when you actually look at the data. Mm -hmm. But there is this culture that you know has evolved that that somehow docs that that practice hormone replacement therapy are doing sort of shoddy medicine or whatever, right? And I, I don't agree with that at all. Mm -hmm. So I think absolutely there's there are certainly people who who when you're when you're clinically you know outside the reference range, then it's then it's clearly appropriate. But I don't see a lot of logic behind the idea that it doesn't make sense to try to maintain at least the key sex hormones at youthful levels, right? Mm -hmm. And so, but we don't have a lot of data either way. We don't have a lot of data showing that if you do that, that it's necessarily beneficial other than people anecdotally report that they feel better and they mm -hmm. can function better. And for men, they can maintain muscle mass better. And, and for women, um, you know, I think treating the symptoms of menopause can have huge benefit for certain women. Mm -hmm. So I'm generally um, pretty positive on hormone replacement therapy, but I also recognize there is there is a point where it can be abused, right? I think there are certainly a fair number of men out there who just want to take testosterone because they, you know, they they don't want to watch what they eat and they want to right. want to have big muscles, right? Yeah. So, um, and I don't again, I don't know, I don't know how dangerous that is because I just don't think we have a lot of data yet on that. Mm. No fair. Okay, so I don't want to pin you down too hard, but I'd love to get your top three or four clocks, assuming that's what you're looking at. That yeah. you would really pay attention to because I'm looking at things like the average person still thinks they need to be checking their cholesterol. Is that a marker? Like, should we really be looking at that? Yes. If you're going to hit 150, that's important. Yes. So there's two things I would say. So, I, and you can put kind of put these in the bins of um, not dying and biological <laughs> aging, right? So rule number one of living a healthy long life is don't die. Yep. And so you need to measure things like your cholesterol. I would I would say the standard blood panel for lipids is not good enough. You want to get your cholesterol peak sizes. You want to look at things like LP little a and ApoB. You probably heard Peter talk about those independent risk factors for cardiovascular mm -hmm. disease. You want to go get a carotid scan, right? <laughs> or a calcium CT scan where you can actually look at the plaques. Mm -hmm. So these are all things you want. Maybe you want to get a whole body MRI. And I'm not saying everybody should get a whole body MRI, but you know, if you can afford it and it's not a big deal, are you worried about the radioactive dye? Well, so, I didn't do it for that reason. So here's the thing, right? Again, there's a, there is a small risk from from radiation, mm. but if you've got a pre-existing cancer that you can catch early that that's going to kill you. Better so again, know. you kind of have to. If money were no object, how frequently would you do that? Oh, that's yeah, that's probably above my pay grade. I haven't really, I haven't. I'll just be honest and say I haven't really thought carefully about the risk reward and mm. looked into the the total exposure. So I would certainly say probably not more than once every few years, mm. um, but uh, but I don't I don't I, I haven't spent a lot of time thinking yeah, about sure. it. But I, I put all of those things in the bin of you know don't die, and so That's you've got bin. you've got you've got to have a set of diagnostics that are going to tell you er, as early as possible if there's a problem, something that's going to kill you, or you know, and I, I say that sort of jokingly because it it, it it makes sense, right? But but. It's also important from a health health span perspective is don't get sick, right? Mm -hmm. So one of the things that, that we've done in you know modern medicine is we've gotten very good at keeping people alive with one, two, three, four age-related diseases. Yep. But living that way is very different 
than living without any age-related diseases. And so you want to make sure you, you maintain you know, your health as long as possible. Mm -hmm. And so I think these same diagnostics can help you catch age-related disease, like metabolic disease, early and then modify appropriately. And that may involve prescription drugs, it may involve lifestyle changes. So, so I think that sort of comprehensive baselining is super important. Um, and then the biological age tests, again, I, you know, I, I hesitate to point to any, I'm not gonna point to any of the specific commercial um, ones, but as, a, as general classes, like you can, you, can, you, can develop, you can use existing clocks and they're, they keep coming out on, on comprehensive blood chemistry, so the clinical stuff, which you're gonna measure over here anyways. Um, epigenetic profiling is, is the most common, and that's where people get a little bit confused because there are literally probably dozens of different epigenetic clocks now, but they all come from the same technology. So you can measure the epigenetic marks in your blood um, comprehensively and then apply different clocks. Mm -hmm. And that's what a lot of the companies are, are doing is just applying different clocks. So from a measurement perspective, it doesn't matter. You just get the most comprehensive epigenetic profile that you can get from blood. Um, there's a couple others. There's a, a, a blood glycans, which are a different kind of chemical moiety in the blood that are thought to re reflect biological age or some aspect of biological age. Um, uh, and then I think you'd want to you'd want to think about doing some, what we would call sort of exploratory endpoints. So um, high dimensional proteomics and the metabolomics. That? that just means measuring proteins. So- Got it, that's so, it's super fancy. Yeah, I know it's, it's, a, like it's a fancy word. What are you <laughs> no, so it's, it's um, you know, old technology that has gotten, gotten a lot, lot better um, where you basically quantify, you know, thousands of proteins in your blood mm. um, at any given time. And, and metabolomics is a, is a, it's a different kind of technology, but conceptually the same. You're looking at the level of hundreds, sometimes thousands, depending on, you, on how you do it, of metabolites. Which come blood. from your microbiome, right? They get absorbed? They come all over the place. So they come from your own cells. Some of them come from the microbiome. Yeah, interesting. It's a, what, it's a picture of everything. Cells kick off metabolites. All your cells are constantly giving out all, all sorts of organic uh, molecules. Yeah, and, and those are all they all fall under metabolites. Yes, learn something. Yeah, I mean there's day. there's there's proteins, there's metabolites, and RNA, and then you could get to a little bit more exotic stuff. But those are the big three. So you can also measure um, RNA from blood, mm -hmm. uh, which tells you about gene expression. So all of these things can be measured with with tools that are available today in, in pretty high dimensionality. The problem is, again, we're still very early in building the clocks from them, but the earlier you get your own samples, you can always go back to that data. So once you've measured it and digitized it, it's always there, right? And so as the clocks get better, you can look backwards in time and see the state that you were in mm -hmm. back then and be informed by how that state changed based on what you were doing in the intervening time. So let me give you an example of why I am uh, a little bit worried that, that, that the epigenetic clocks have gotten ahead of themselves. So there's an emerging, I think pretty significant question about what the epigenetic clocks have been measuring that has yet to be resolved. But, mm -hmm. but it's, there, there's emerging evidence um, from a couple of different labs that one of the major signals that comes out of these epigenetic clocks is the composition of the types of immune cells in your blood at a given point in time. So there are multiple types of different immune cells in our, in our blood, and they all have their own type-specific epigenetic profile. But when you're measuring these epigenetic clocks, what you're measuring really is a, you know, a, a, all of that at the same time on top of each other, right? Um, and all of those cells are probably aging. Your body's, whole body's aging. But um, you can get changes in the composition of the immune cells, like what percent are you know, different types of immune cells at a given time, very quickly. You, you get an infection, the composition of your immune system is gonna be very different than it was before you got that infection. And then it's gonna change as you clear out that infection. That, I would speculate, will greatly change these epigenetic clocks and make it look like you are aging rapidly or reversing aging rapidly. No, what you really did was you got infected, you had the appropriate response and you cleared that in infection. And so they are, they have been built um, to predict usually mortality based on samples that were available. And those usually come from blood samples that were collected across thousands of people as part of these large epidemiological studies. The problem is 
we don't always understand what the potential artifacts are involved in building these kinds of tools um, because we haven't really thought carefully about what the what the population was that the samples came from. Mm -hmm. And so we may find out that most of what these early phase epigenetic clocks were really telling us about were immune status, right? How healthy is your immune system, mm -hmm. which is a part of biological aging, but it's probably not the whole thing. And so, um, it, and they may actually be telling us more about whether you have a pathogen or how well your immune system is functioning or how inflamed you are at that given snapshot in time. Mm -hmm. This is, and I and actually, I actually think that there's going to be some truth to this because to me, that's how you explain the sort of very rapid changes in these clocks that some people have claimed, right? Some mm -hmm. people have claimed that they can reverse their epigenetic age by 10 years in, in a period of a couple of months um, or five years in a period of a couple of months. And biologically, it just doesn't make a lot of sense. I and mean, it's possible, can't rule it out, but it's, it, it does make a lot of sense that you can remodel your immune system in that time frame. Because and, it's such a high turnover system. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Um, now, that's one thing I will give Brian credit for is he said, eh, if somebody's really asking me my biological age, I have hundreds of ages. It's yeah, yeah, you know, right. tissue dependent and everything's going to be yeah. different. Some are harder to measure than others. Yeah. And, and there is still this open question of do all tissues age at the same rate? Mm. No, they don't. They all, there is some coordinating principle that's causing all of our tissues to age. But you look at the, the female ovary. I mean, that's a really good example of a, a place where aging that's is greatly accelerated, right? Yeah. Um, so, so clearly, no, they don't all age at the same do rate. You, uh, you may hate this question because it's just speculation, but do you have any guess why women stop being able to reproduce so young? Is it that they're getting too frail? They're more likely to pass on genetic mutations? Like, you yeah. have to assume that evolution tried it, where women stayed fertile forever. Yeah, that's a good, and, that's a good question. So this is getting a little bit outside my area of expertise. I think, um, I think there's certainly this school of thought that, that menopause is evolved, like it was selected for mm. specifically. Um, and, and actually, you know, you, what you said is kind of interesting, which is that evolution must have tried it. So it's right. certainly in our close primate ancestors, they don't undergo a similar kind of menopause. Um, and so I think it's likely that it was an evolved trait as we went down the, the hominid lineage. Why it evolved, I think, you know, that that's, again, it's, it's become speculative, but it, it, you know, there is speculation around the, um, the idea that, and certainly there's evidence that egg quality declines with age, that you're much more likely to get um, severe birth defects and uh, things like that as, as a woman is older. Mm -hmm. And so, um, it's probably easier to evolve ovarian senescence than it is to try to evolve mechanisms that would fix that, that problem of egg quality going down. I don't find that super satisfying. It, it's just a little bit hard for me to think about how you get enough um, selective pressure to evolve a process specifically for senescence of the ovary just from that. But the, the real answer is, I don't know. I mean, like you said, it's, it's very speculative and, and I, don't, I don't know that we have a good answer. But I do think, what, what I do think is more interesting and more clear is that that process in women of ovarian senescence and menopause then has add-on effects throughout the rest of the body, right? That accelerate aging, we think, I guess I should be a little careful, accelerate the onset of aging phenotypes in other other parts of the body. Interesting. And so these, again, these tissues and organs are all talking to each other. And I don't think that's at all selected. I think it's a, it's a byproduct though of the whole process of, of menopause. Mm. Um, and then just to, to give you one more sort of tidbit, which I think is pretty cool, going back to rapamycin, one of the places where it's been pretty surprising to me to see is in mice, you can actually reverse ovarian degeneration with rapamycin. So Whoa. that's another place where rapamycin has a regenerative process. Will the rats start ovulating yep. again? What? Mice. Yep. So you can you can take a mouse can, out of uh, being, they're infertile, they're postmenopausal, and bring them back into uh, yeah, estrus? I, I should be careful. Mice don't go through menopause. They go through a, a I don't remember the word. There's a different word for it. So, so it's, it's a different biological process in a uh -huh. sense, but they do become infertile. And I should be a little careful because I don't think any of these papers have been published yet. This is all from what I've heard at meetings. So, but yes, I've seen data Whoa. shown at meetings where they show that the mice that got rapamycin are able to reproduce. 
mice that didn't get rapamycin are no longer able to reproduce. Okay, so now- This is late onset, so. Now okay. we have to start, because I'm getting excited again about rapamycin. Um, I've gotten very excited about metformin and was like, mm, I'm not gonna take this. The number of people that, uh, not everyone, so I'll leave everyone to speculate, but the number of people that I've had on the show that off camera are like, yeah, you should take metformin. <laughs> and I know a guy that's a very high level surgeon and he was like, oh yeah, you should take metformin. I take metformin. And I was just like, I am always tense about taking exogenous substances. Sure. And just cause who knows the balance, like take vitamin D. I'm just convinced that the sun falling on your skin does more than just trigger the production of vitamin D. So I'm like, if you're avoiding the sun and supplementing vitamin D, the odds that you're getting exactly what you need are basically zero. So sure. I'm a little sketched out. So I didn't take metformin. And now it's starting to come out, well, maybe metformin isn't as good for you as we originally thought. So as I get excited about rapamycin, yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, how I think should I think about I think that? it's a totally legitimate uh, perspective. And, and I, I maybe don't go quite that far, but uh, but I'm pretty skeptical of supplements, and I've been public about that for for that reason. Like it's like there's not a ton of evidence most of the time, and you never know what the consequences might be. So, one thing I'll say about rapamycin is rapamycin is interesting because it started with a bad reputation because of the way it was clinically developed. So, if you go to almost any physician who doesn't know anything about rapamycin, they're going to look up the side effect list, and they're going to be like this is an organ transplant drug. You shouldn't take this. Why would you take this, right? So it started from the bad reputation place. Um, do you want to talk about metformin? Because metformin is pretty interesting. So, yeah. so I'm, I, I'm, I'm definitely in the camp that uh, people who don't have glucose homeostasis uh, challenges probably shouldn't take metformin for aging. So the evidence there in mice is actually pretty weak. Metformin does either does not increase lifespan in mice or it increases lifespan by like 5%. So, mm. you know, caloric restriction, rapamycin, metformin in terms of magnitude of effect. And in the one study where it, it was tested and it showed that 5% extension of lifespan, they tested two doses. This isn't talked about, but the other dose shortened lifespan by 10%. So the evidence that metformin really is a potent longevity drug, not so great. Mm. Um, now, certainly in people, it's a very good anti diabetes drug. And there's a little bit of evidence that now has turned out, I think there's been contradictory evidence. There was, there was an initial paper that showed that diabetics taking metformin, they lived much longer than diabetics not taking metformin, and maybe even a little longer than non-diabetics not taking metformin. That's the data that gets pointed to in people as the best evidence that metformin might have an impact on longevity in humans. Hmm. That sense has not replicated, at least in one other study. I don't know, I don't know what the answer is there. But, um, but did you ever take metformin? No, I've never taken metformin. So there was something there enough that made you go, mm, probably not, but rapamycin, yeah. I've heard you do take at least occasionally. Yeah, yes, that's right. The other thing I wanna say about metformin though, because most people don't appreciate this, and I didn't actually know this until recently, is that um, in men, a significant fraction of men taking metformin, it actually has a negative impact on testosterone. And it's mm. not clear to me whether that's reversible or not. Whoa. So yeah, so I would just think about that in the whole context of side effects. Do you effects, know the mechanism? Right? No, here's the problem with metformin. Nobody knows the mechanism. It's a huh. super dirty drug. So it's- Dirty meaning it, it, it impacts it, it a lot of It hits a stuff. bunch of stuff, yeah. So it's talked about as an AMP kinase activator, definitely as a mitochondrial inhibitor, so it inhibits the electron transport chain, probably has, 10 or 12 other targets. So we don't really know exactly how metformin's working. And we don't know if it's the same target for the different effects of metformin. So anyways, that, that's why I wouldn't take it. Um, uh, so rapamycin um, has a much better track record in terms of actually reproducibly and robustly impacting the biology of aging. Mm -hmm. And it's not just lifespan. So we talked a lot about lifespan, but you know, as we've alluded to in mice, at least, you can either delay functional declines or in at least four different organs and tissues now, reverse those functional declines, giving it to mice in older age. Wow. So the potential upside I see from rapamycin, again, purely speculative that it's gonna work in people the same way. But the potential upside is so much greater than it is for metformin, just based on the preclinical work that that goes in the you know risk reward, that goes in the potential reward pile. Okay. So then the question is, what are the real risks? And um, 
we've gotten a lot more data in the last five years on what the risk profile of sort of non-organ transplant lower dose rapamycin looks like. And we haven't published it yet, but um, we hopefully will be in the next, we'll probably submit it in the next couple of weeks. We did a survey based study of about 300 and 333 people who've been using rapamycin off-label. We compared them to about 150 kind of age-matched, demographically matched people who've never used rapamycin and looked at a whole bunch of stuff. And so it looks like the side effects from, from you know, off-label use of rapamycin, the, the ones that are real are mouth sores for about 10% of the people. That's a known side effect of rapamycin. Mm. Um, and then it probably does increase risk of bacterial infection by maybe twofold. So you can look at that and be like, oh my God, or you can look at it and be like two times a small number is a small number, right? Mm. So, but it probably does increase risk of infection by about twofold, bacterial infection. Interesting. Is it, um, uh, okay, so going back to we're lowering the immune response, got it. Here's the thing though, it actually seems to enhance resistance to viral infections. Huh? because it turns up antiviral gene expression through mechanisms that aren't understood. Okay. That, that's come out of some clinical trials, and that seems to be in our group. And one of the things we looked at in our group was COVID-19. So this was actually you know, fortuitous timing that we had just come through this whole COVID-19 pandemic. And so we were able to ask people, you know, are you vaccinated? Did you get infected? If you did get infected, what was your infection like? Was it mild, so less than a week, more than a week? Or did you have to go to the hospital? Mm. And then are you still experiencing symptoms or did you experience symptoms that look like long COVID, okay? And here's the thing where, again, these are all fairly small numbers. I told you the size of the group, right? But So it's not like I wanna put a, a, a huge amount of uh, certainty behind this, but, but, but I've been in this business long enough to kind of look at data and I know what looks like questionable and what I think is probably real. Mm. The one thing I think that's probably real that came out of this is the, the people who took rapamycin continuously, so before, during, and after their COVID-19 infection, had a much lower risk of anything other than a mild infection. Whoa. So almost nobody had a moderate infection, and none of them Whoa. had a severe infection, had to go to the hospital. None of them got long COVID. Am I just not remembering so, people talking about this, or are you like a lone voice in the wilderness? On I, this? I'm telling you some unpublished data right now. There have oh. been people talking about rapamycin for COVID. Um, uh, it hasn't gotten as much attention as it probably should. Huh. Um, one one place where where people, I think they tried to do a clinical trial and it just never got off the ground was for for. Uh, uh, severe COVID infections when you get this cytokine storm yeah. using rapamycin to knock that down. Yeah, but um, Joan Manick did a clinical trial. She did two clinical trials with a drug called Everolimus, which is a derivative of rapamycin. So for this com conversation, you can just think of it as like rapamycin. It mm. works exactly the same way. Where they showed that you could improve flu vaccine response in healthy elderly people through six weeks of Everolimus. Before, you get a better during, vaccine or response. after? Uh, before the vaccine, mm. so short-term treatment, and then you give them the vaccine, then you get a better response to the vaccine. Do we know how long it lasts? No, because these these trials were all so just one-offs. Yeah, but it kind of makes sense with the mouse rejuvenation part, right? So you 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 restore homeostasis, mm. and then you give the vaccine. You're going to do better than if you give the vaccine when you've got too much self and not enough, you know, appropriate response. Right. So that part makes sense. What was interesting there was was they went back after the fact and looked at um, number of infections those people got in the next, I think it was either six months or a year. And it didn't protect against everything, but the people who got the mTOR inhibitor had um, lower risk of subsequent flu, vac flu infection or coronavirus infection. This was done in 2019. So this was before COVID-19, mm -hmm. nobody knew about COVID-19, but that was one of the particular viruses where it seemed to have this protective effect. So. so basically, it may have a protective effect against your sort of basic cold. Viral, yes. Viral, yeah. 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 I assume most colds yeah. are viral. Yeah. What I think of as right. a traditional head cold. Right. That's huge. Yep. Uh, this is an organ transplant drug though. So is this, this is one of those, if I go to my doctor, hey, prescribe me rapamycin. He's going to be like, dude, no. First of all, he's not even going to know what rapamycin is because it's really? called sirolimus in the clinical world. Sirolimus? <laughs> yeah. Same drug, two different words. Hmm. Yeah. So, but yes, if you went to him and said, you know, I, I want to start taking sirolimus, um, if he knows anything about it, he, he would probably say, 
you know, there's a long list of side effects. It's risky. It's going to suppress your immune system. Why would you want to do that? And, you know, I mean, again, as I said, I think it probably is a real effect. It's not, it's not a strong immune suppression, but it probably does slightly increase risk of bacterial infections, which is why some people have started cycling. Like they'll take rapamycin for six weeks or 10 mm-hmm. weeks and then stop for several months and then start again. And, um, and I, I, I kind of, I kind of like that, that approach. First of all, I should say, I'm not suggesting anybody start taking rapamycin. I'm not mm-hmm. an MD. This is not, I'm sure you have a disclaimer, but, but I, I need to, I want to be careful because I, I, I'm, I'm very, um, excited about the data that we've got so far, but I also want to be clear that we don't know that yeah. this is going to work for everybody. We don't know it's going to slow aging. Um, and, and we're still figuring out what the side effects are. So I'm certainly not suggesting people should run out and start taking rapamycin. Um, but it kind of makes sense that you would get that slight uptick in risk of bacterial infection um, because you're knocking down inflammation. And I, th- mm-hmm. I think that's how most of the beneficial effects of rapamycin that people experience where you, they, and I've had several people tell me, like, I feel so much better after taking it. I think it's really the people who have high levels of sterile inflammation. They're the ones who notice the effects. Um, so, but it's not, probably not going to benefit everybody in that context. Mm. Or, and, and the other thing I think, think I should say is, you know, rapamycin is not so different from fasting. Fasting hits mTOR. Rapamycin hits mTOR. Fasting knocks down inflammation. Rapamycin knocks down inflammation. So they overlap a lot in their biological effects. They're not identical, but they overlap a lot in their mm. biological effects. Um, but people don't always appreciate that that also means that most of the side effects from rapamycin are also side effects from fasting. <laughs> but we think about dietary interventions as, you know, safe right. and pharmaceuticals as dangerous. And, you know, there's this discussion. That is my rough analysis. Yeah. Like if I can get the exact same effects, am I better off just doing the fasting? Sometimes. Yeah. Fasting mm. again is a dirty drug. Rapamycin is a clean drug, right? So fasting hits thousands of metabolic pathways. Rapamycin is pretty specific, so, but what does that mean, you know, in terms of benefit and risk reward and all of that? I don't, I don't know. Very interesting. Very interesting. So I want to close the loop on this idea. You've talked about homeostasis as one of the things you can look at for whether your prime condition, youthful condition, whatever you want to think about, how yeah. rapidly are you able to get back to baseline? Is there, um, I mean, do you just look at that in terms of like colds, cuts, scrapes, like yeah. exercising to your heart rate back to normal again? Yeah, I don't, I mean, I don't think there's a right answer to that question. I think, you know, this idea of resilience has gained a lot of um, attention in the field as a, as a phenotype of aging, or in some mm. ways it's a biomarker, right? How quickly are you able to return to baseline? Um, I think there are lots of different ways you can, you can look at it. In some ways, it probably depends a little bit on your bias. Again, I tend to put a lot more faith in functional measures like wound healing because that's important. I mean, that is, you know, that, that, that's, that's important to your quality of life, but it's also telling you something about your likelihood if you get a serious wound of, of being able to recover from it, right? So, so I, think, I think those are good measures. I think you can look at, you can look at, at performance measures like you know, uh, heart rate variability and things like that, or recovery from exercise, those are probably telling you the same type of information. Mm. I just don't think, I don't, I don't know if we have enough, if we have as much data on those kinds of measures and how they're integrating into the biology of aging. I mean, clearly they're integrated. I just don't know if we have as much data on, on that. Um, so I, yeah, so I, I don't, I guess I don't know how to answer your question in, in great detail mm. other than to say that I think there are, you, you could look at, you know, um, I guess to some extent glucose response is, is kind of a similar kind of metric. So, you know, when you, you could do a glucose tolerance test and actually that's probably not a bad idea. Mm. We're going back to the kind of what would you measure? Yeah. I think a glucose tolerance test is kind of that kind, that sort of a measure where you greatly perturb the system and then you look at how quickly is it able to respond. That's another measure of resilience of your, your metabolic um, system. Yeah, that's why I found this interesting. I'd never heard anybody talk about homeostasis as a big signal to you. And, you know, also just thinking about long COVID as potentially one of these, where it's, it is a mechanism of not being able to get yeah. back to homeostasis. And I wish I knew what was happening. I mean, I obviously, lots of people wish they knew what was <laughs> happening with long COVID, right? But my, I speculate that it is a sort of 
again, chronic inflammatory reaction mm. to the initial infection. And so to me, it makes sense that rapamycin and other things like rapamycin might have beneficial effects right. there. Yeah, I, this is why getting to the underlying, um, what, it, what is the organizing principle of this thing that's happening? So yeah. what are the, the nine hallmarks of aging have in common? Yeah. What are driving them? I actually, because you said it in that context, I want to come back to something you said before, which is that, you know, one of my sort of guiding principles is, is around inflammation. And that's kind mm -hmm. of true. I mean, I think in, in mammals, this increase in chronic or sterile inflammation is driving a lot of the functional declines that go along with aging. But I have to say, you know, I was very late to the inflammation game, and I actually don't think that's uh, the fundamental feature of biological aging. And the reason why I don't is, you know, I, I talked earlier about how mTOR and rapamycin came initially out of studies in invertebrate models, and yeast and C. elegans and fruit flies. Yeast don't have an immune system. They're a single-celled organism. Right. Yet rapamycin works there, mTOR works there. C. elegans have an extremely rudimentary innate immune system. Uh, uh, but there's not a lot of evidence that, that inflammation is driving much around aging in those organisms, and yet mTOR inhibition works there, rapamycin works there. So it's hard, it's possible that rapamycin and mTOR evolved to affect aging by completely different mechanisms in mammals than it did in invertebrates. But that's, to my mind, very difficult to, to credit. I think it's much more likely that there's an underlying principle that's shared in all of these species for how mTOR and rapamycin are affecting aging. And it just turns out that this increase in sterile inflammation is a downstream consequence of mTOR hyperactivation that leads to many of the, the at least the functional and health declines that, that we notice the most, the aches and pains that go along with aging, the debilitating changes that go along with aging, and probably the increased risk of cancer, at least to some extent, because your immune system isn't clearing the cancers anymore. Mm. The reason I think that kind of thinking is so important, having the organizing principle, is it allows you to create a narrative, which I'll say is just another word for hypothesis. Yeah. I think things are working in this way. Yeah. And for my non-scientifically minded people, once you have the hypothesis, it'll make predictions. Yep. So if this is true, then this also has to be true. Yep. And now I can go test yep. that thing. Yep. Uh, I have found that really useful in my life for one, make sure I understand somebody. Oh, if you're saying this and it predicts this, did it? Yes. Oh, yeah. okay, cool. Then I actually understand. And then two, how I filter what I try and what I don't try because, hey, it'll make a prediction that either yeah. uh, if, yeah. if this is true and that's yeah. true, I'm not interested. Right. right. But you're now starting to get some of the answers to these predictions with the dogs. And so I know the study's not done yet, but I've heard you say that you are starting to get some pretty interesting insights out of what's happened. So, so what I can tell you, and, and I mean, it's been frustratingly slow to get to this point. Um, what I can tell you is we've done two short-term clinical trials that gave some preliminary results that are encouraging, right? Mm -hmm. So the, the, the things that seem rock solid is we really have no evidence for any significant side effects uh, from rapamycin in dogs which is important for a clinical trial in people's pets, right? I think of this very much like a pediatric clinical trial. Mm. Um, so you really wanna make sure that it's safe. The, the other things that are in, potentially interesting in terms of improvements, um, uh, we found some evidence for a reversal of age-related heart decline, a specific component of the heart or chamber of the heart, the left ventricle, we were able to measure that is potential specific. improvements. And that was based on mouse work. So we, we basically measured exactly the same parameters. You were expecting it. Well, because we had a, we had a hypothesis, right, that, it, that, that if this is conserved, if it works in mice, then it will work in dogs, right? Mm. And so that's why we measured that. Um, uh, and the evidence looked like it did. So, mm. you know, a small study, short term, but, but it looked, um, looked pretty real. And then the other things that I think are interesting is in both of the, the the short-term trials, the owners, and they were blinded, this is double-blind, placebo-controlled, self-reported that their dogs were more active. And so that makes sense. Again, you know, the, the way I think about this is dogs, just like people, as we get older, you get, a, you get, you get, a, you get more uh, sterile inflammation, autoimmunity. That leads to a lot of the aches and pains and joints, rheumatoid arthritis is an autoimmune disorder, right? And so if rapamycin is sort of generally tamping that down, you might see that as a decline in pain, which would then be 
translated to an increase in activity in an old yeah. dog. So that's speculative, but it kind of fits with, mm. with, and it also fits with you know what I know from my own personal experiences and from talking to lots of people about rapamycin in humans. Mm. So that seems like it's probably real. Um, the one thing I will say though is because it's owner reported, we really want to get the quantitative activity monitors. So like you know little collar trackers that where we can actually so you look can get at activity. the data. Yeah, whether it yeah, actually yeah, yeah. is or not. Yeah, but uh, but I you know I felt I, I felt pretty good about the quality of the owner reported data that we've gotten, not just for the rapamycin trial, but in the larger dog aging project. Mm. It seems more accurate than I than I would have thought um, going in. People mm. pay a lot of attention to their dogs and and can actually report the data. Yeah, no, I heard yeah. you mention that for some people, because you always refer to them as companion Yeah, animals. pet and companion are sort of inter right. interchangeable. It's just that the, the, the word pet, you know, has sort of a, a connotation that, that some people don't appreciate. And so yeah. companion is, is probably a better word. The only reason I don't use that word all the time is because some people, when I say companion dog, think of service dogs. That's exactly right? what so, I thought. Yeah. But then when I heard you clarify yeah. that, you know, a lot of people think of their pet companion animal as right. one of their children. And I was like, oh yeah, that's me. Yeah. And that's when I realized, oh, you just, you're just you just giving a warm name to pet dog. Right. Got it. And so that is, I'm really intrigued. And if this ends up, and I'm assuming you did it on dogs because it's just such a faster life cycle, you can learn more than if you're trying to do it on humans. Uh, and because dogs share our environment. So again, if you think about what we know in a laboratory is in this very sterile controlled environment. Mm. And whereas companion dogs, with the exception of food, and even <laughs> depends, on the, depends on the household, sometimes even the food, they share pretty much every aspect of the human environment. Yeah. So it's a, it's a way to capture environmental complexity. The other is the genetic diversity. So dogs are sort of unique in this um, uh, breed structure that humans have, have created, right, through selection. We've got purebred breeds, but then on top of that, we've got this, this um, mixed breed genetic architecture, mm -hmm. which is very interesting and, and powerful, but can match to some extent the diversity of the human population. So, uh, you know, I don't know if we're going to be powered enough to really get to true sort of personalized outcomes in our mm -hmm. trial. But in the larger dog aging project, where we have 44,000 dogs now, mm. we actually do have enough power to actually say, okay, in these, in these breeds, you know, there is this genetic component to this aging process or to this interaction between aging and diet and things mm. like that. It's incredible. I want to talk about obesity. So you made a really interesting distinction between whether caloric restriction is actually the thing that's having the benefit or if it's just not being fat. Yeah. Talk to me about fat as an organ. Why does that hypothesis spring to mind? So, so I, think, I think the question of whether in laboratory animals where we know caloric restriction can extend lifespan is purely an anti-obesity uh, response is a valid response because of the way that we maintain animals in the laboratory. They do become obese with age. They are overfed. Um, and I've heard people criticize that by saying, well, that means it's not gonna work in humans. Well, look around. Uh, I mean, you know, ooh, you sure? <laughs> so, so I don't think that's a good argument yeah. for for saying that caloric restriction is not going to work in, in humans. I do think it is an, an important question whether uh, obesity is just on the same spectrum with respect to biological aging. In other words, is is you know, are we going if from, this is very simple, I don't believe it's true, but let's just make it simple. You know, if you're calorically restricted, you're aging the slowest. If you're at a normal weight, you're aging at a rate in the middle. And if you're obese, you're aging in an accelerated mm. way. I think conceptually, there's probably some truth to that. And in fact, we see that obesity is associated with, you know, higher risk for a whole bunch of different age-related disorders. Are you disorders. aging faster, if this is accurate, are you aging faster because you're just eating more things and you're asking your body to process it? Or is it actively holding the fat, mm -hmm. whether it's the hormonal signal that fat kicks off yep. or it's the compression of the organs. I mean, it's probably, it's, it's certainly some of it is that. Some of it is driven by adipose itself, mm. right? We know that adipose gives off uh, inflammatory signal. Keep coming, keep coming back to inflammation. That's but what I'm saying. It gives off inflammatory signals, principle. right? So, so absolutely, uh, the fat itself can contribute. I think also the, you know, you, 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 I think you were alluding to this, the, the physical um, effect of gravity, just being heavier, mm. wears down your 
your joints and your organs. And so I think that probably plays a role as well. Um, that's something we don't really think about in the biology of aging very much is the impact of, of gravity <laughs> on our bodies, mm. right? And, and that's actually maybe important. It might mean that some of the stuff we do if we reverse biological aging is only gonna be so effective because we're not gonna change gravity unless we go with Elon and go to Mars, right? You know, so, so, uh, so that probably is important in the context of adipose though. There is this mm. physical component there. Um, but I don't think that's all of it. I mean, I think, I think some of it uh, is probably just from enhanced metabolism and the impact of that enhanced metabolism on other tissues and organs on your liver. You know, which is kind of the first pass for all this stuff on your kidneys, which have to detoxify all the stuff you're taking in mm. on your circulatory system. So that all is going to affect the aging of the rest of your body, not only because of, of the adipose itself. Super interesting. Yeah, that's one of the things when I think about our modern diet and I think about organizing principles. So what's the underlying cause and effect? Yeah. Um, we're, oh God, is it we're it, we're extending life, but not health span, or is this the first generation that's going to live less time? Either way, it's it remains we're not to be in great seen. Shape. Yeah, no, it really remains to be seen what's going to happen to life expectancy going forward. But yeah, I mean, obviously, a huge swath of the population in pretty much every developed country mm. is unhealthy. Oh, so and not. and I don't so so a couple of things I would say. I don't think you can argue that. Uh, we have been successful at keeping sick people alive longer. Mm. I think you can have a debate about how much of the life expectancy over the last 30 years is better health and how much of it is poor health. But I think it's clear a significant fraction is poor health. And then you put on top of that these cultural and societal forces which have led the vast majority of people to eat an unhealthy diet and become sedentary. Um, and that's just you know compounding the whole thing and yeah, it's, you know, it's, um, we'll see where it goes. I mean, I, I think I'm not super optimistic that medicine is going to be the solution. Um, you know, I think we've, we've had a couple of uh, exciting developments in anti-obesity drugs, and we'll see how effective they are over the long term and whether what they're, mechanism they're are they using? ever it... able to, you know, be, be used widely, right? Um, so there's a few. So I think I think the um, the newest ones are actually mostly inhibiting uh, appetite. So they kind of make you mm. nauseous. So you don't want. So to you eat. just don't want to. Yeah. Eat. The thing I've heard though, and I haven't read the study, so simple. so don't 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 quote. Well, I guess you can't quote me on this. I'm gonna say it. But <laughs> we will quote I'll, you I'll, I'll, as you say. <laughs> don't quote us. Fair. Yeah. We get it. So um, uh, I have read though that there's now some concerns about rebound. So when people come off the drugs, you know, they rebound, yeah. and and that, yeah. that we know about this from yo-yo -yo dieting a and all of that. in the brain. You know, this is where I'm going to, I would, I would rapidly get outside of my area of expertise mm. if I started commenting too, too deeply on this. I think there is absolutely, uh, uh, effects of many of the highly processed foods and high calorie foods that are easily available today on the brain mm. that reinforce this process. I don't think anybody really would argue with that. Is it a formal addiction or not? People, you know, that's a word that I think triggers some people. And so I don't, I don't know that that's important, but Clearly, um, there are changes in brain chemistry associated with eating certain foods that reinforce that behavior mm. and contribute to the obesity epidemic around, around the world. And I mean, look, some of these things were developed for that purpose, right? I mean, some of these, these uh, companies that, that created these foods put a lot of research into figuring out how do, you know, this, how do we impact this, what's it called, the bliss number or something, yeah. uh, this, this scale, right? <laughs> you know, That's to make crazy. the brain fire. So I think um, there might be, be something shocking. else going on as well. So I'll throw, I'm just not, I don't have a scientific pedigree to protect, so I'll just pontificate. Um, I think that part of what might be going on is your microbiome is adjusting to yep. what you eat. It's sending neurochemical signals to your brain of like, crave this, yep. crave this, crave this. And then on top of that, I have heard, I don't know if this is going to pan out or not, but I have heard from uh, somebody, they believe it, and they are very much a scientist in FDA trials right now, and they believe that they have a mechanism by which you can... Um, adjust the hypothalamus's um, basically weight fat set point, set point yeah. so that the amount of fat the body wants adjusts yeah. and that his hypothesis is 
you have a set point. Your body wants, I don't know if you want to put in percentage, pounds, whatever, I don't know. But it has some amount of fat that it wants on your body, and you can diet all you want. You'll lose the fat, but as soon as you stop dieting, it goes right back or more. And until you adjust that set point, all you can hope to do is is yo-yo. Yeah. That's interesting. Now, if you combine that with the microbiome is screaming out for things and you've got the set point, you're going to rock it to that. So, so yeah. So, I mean, I think there's there's certainly some truth to the whole set point idea. And, and I don't know I don't know what you're referring to, so I, don't, I can't comment on likelihood that that's mm-hmm. going to be successful. A couple things to say. So, I think the microbiome is is uh, link is super interesting, and definitely there's some evidence that that for exactly what you said, which is that the the diet you eat remodels the microbiome. And then the microbiome indeed is sending signals throughout your body, not just to the brain, throughout your body and these metabolites that we talked about before. So they get into your circulatory system. Um, And that that probably does play some role in the, I don't know whether you want to call it habituation or changes in brain chemistry, you know, whatever the process is that's reinforcing this desire to continue to eat that way. Mm. Is it a big role? Is it a small role? I don't think we know enough at this point to know, Um, but it, it, it almost certainly is... Uh, is important. Um, And the microbiome interacts with your immune system. So again, the the gut is, I think, the largest immune organ in the body, right, because of these interactions Mm -hmm. with the microbiome. And so that's probably also driving a lot of the changes in immune function that that happen um, as well in response to these, these, you know, low-quality diets that lead to obesity. So Mm -hmm. again, it's all interconnected, and the signaling is... um, complicated. Yes, it is. Yeah, super complicated, but so interesting. All right, as somebody that's going to deploy this stuff, I always find it very interesting to see where people are in terms of if they have kids, which I know you at least have one. two boys. You learn real fast what people really believe in. So (laughs) what, how do you feed your kids? Uh, Would you have them supplement anything? Yeah. Like, how does that play out? Yeah. Yeah. So, so we have always, uh, let me not say always. So when the kids were very young, I will admit, we did take them to McDonald's once yeah. in a while, but we haven't done that for years. We've, and this so is, they complain. What about not going to McDonald's? Yeah. No. Interesting. No, I uh, know, but we never did it all the time. Mm. So, so I, I should say this is, this is more my wife than me because she was, she, first of all, was much smarter about diet than I was <laughs> earlier. So she, she was telling me things that I now am, you know, saying out loud, mm-hmm. right? Or be- 10 years before I actually started practicing them. So, so she really was the one that drove this. But, but we were pretty healthy. So she uh, made a strong effort to ensure that, you know, we eat mostly whole foods, uh, uh, lots of vegetables, um, and, um, but we're not perfect and we never have tried to be perfect. And again, I think there's this, you know, this is where I think it becomes very individual. And, and, and I think that some people can function in a very rigid sort of lifestyle and that works for them. But I think most people can't. And so I, I, we have never tried to say, oh, you can never have a hamburger or cheeseburger or whatever. You can never have candy, but try to make sure that the day to day sort of, uh, normal, uh, life at home is a healthy one. Supplements, um, I j- vitamin D we give to our younger son because he is also vitamin D deficient um, and probably a, a multivitamin and that's you about have one it. who is and one who isn't. Well, uh, our oldest one has never no. Our oldest one I don't know if he's ever been tested to be honest with you. Our okay, youngest one say, got whoa, tested. No, our youngest one got tested. Our oldest one is out of the house now, so it's a little got bit different it. situation then. But how old were you when you had him? <laughs> um, he was born in two thousand two, and I'm wow. going to be fifty two. So yeah. Wow. 2002 sounds like oh, a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, I know, it's right? Crazy <laughs> that yeah, that's a 21 year old. Yeah, whoa. Uh, but but you know we're not super big on supplements. So mm-hmm. so my wife takes a multivitamin. I don't. I, I actually I've been thinking about this. I need to go get a comprehensive vitamin uh, panel. I don't think I'm going to be deficient in anything, but I need to find out. Mm-hmm. But I don't. I I don't like the idea of mega dosing. So you know. Finding the right balance for vitamins is important. And so I want to figure out where I'm at and then figure out what, if anything, I need to supplement mm. other than vitamin D, which I already know. So interesting, man. I really like the way that you approach things. Where can people follow you? So 
Um, I would suggest that people follow me at the Dog Aging Project, which I've got my shirt on, yes, dogagingproject.org. And I'll also make a plug. If anybody out there has a dog, any age, any kind, any size, consider participating in the Dog Aging Project. We are- Which uh, they can do from home. Yeah, absolutely. Go to the website, nominate your dog, and uh, you can complete the survey. And um, it's the largest open science project for uh, canines in the world. And our goal is to increase health and longevity for pet dogs. So mm. if you have a dog, I'm sure you think that's a worthwhile goal. And I'd encourage you to participate in the project. Yes, I do. That's awesome. All right, guys, if you haven't already, be sure to subscribe. And until next time, my friends, be legendary. Take care. Peace. <laughs> Click here now to learn how to reset your age, look younger, and live forever. And he said, I thought I was gonna fail, but do you see what I'm seeing? And I said, yeah, I see it. Said, what are you seeing? I said, the future.